Welcome to the Smart Driving Cars podcast. Thank you for tuning in once again. This edition is made possible by CARTS, the Corporation for Automated Road Transportation Safety, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to safe and high-quality mobility for all. I'm Fred Fishkin, along with the Faculty Chair of Autonomous Vehicle Engineering at Princeton University, Alan Kornhauser. Hi, Alan. Hey, good morning, Fred. Good morning, and joining us from Sweden, where it's afternoon, for episode 301 is consultant and publisher of The Dispatcher, Michael Senna. Hi, Michael. Great to see you. Hi, Fred. Hi, Alan. Wonderful to be here again. Always nice. Well, in the February edition of The Dispatcher, the lead article is headlined, Driverless Work Vehicles on This Side of the Horizon. Michael, maybe we should start off with your take on where we are today when it comes to driverless work vehicles versus driverless passenger cars. We're a lot farther along with driverless work vehicles, which wouldn't be very difficult because we're right now we're not very far at at all with uh, passenger, um, (laughs) driverless passenger vehicles. But um, That's harsh, Michael. <laughs> yeah, it's harsh, but it's reality. What I've tried to do in, in this article is to give pride of place for uh, applications of driverless technology, which are in line with what we've been doing as humans for the last uh, 200,000 or 2 million years, depending on how far we want to go back. Uh, as, I started, as I said in the, in the lead into the, uh, into the article, We've been automating as many things as we possibly could do over the course of our history. That just seems to be part of our nature. Uh, I I didn't mention that we've we've also done things like invented fly fishing, so we didn't we couldn't catch so many fish just to make it a sport. Um, But everything else we've done is essentially getting fewer hands to get more work done so that either we can do something else, which I don't think we've been very good about either. Um, But, um, yeah, we're automating work is what we do. And putting vehicles that can do more without more of our human hands involved is something that we've we've begun and have been doing very well for quite a a long time. I mean, just, you know, taking it, a tractor versus having oxen. Uh, that, 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 that back then, that was the ultimate in, in uh, automation. So we're seeing now, we're seeing more and more vehicles that, that do something that's work, that's not transporting people, that's not, not taking us into, uh, into the, the realm of being chauffeured by the car and us sitting, you know, sitting in the back seat. It's actually getting something done, like plowing a field or, or getting uh, insecticides over the course of, a, of a, a large orchard. And I've given lots of examples of, of what's being done already. Including by the military. And you have some different classifications. Right. Yeah, the classifications. classifications the classifications. I, what I, what I, I always, I think, as you know, I, what I've tried to do is, is to make things visual so that people can see, they can get get a feeling for. Well, you know, this fits into this area. This fits into that area. There, there, there are all as always. There are fuzzy boundaries between these. But essentially, saying that there, are, there are different classifications. Certain things are being done. By, by vehicles that work in a, in a very restricted area. Other things are being done in, in a, in, by vehicles in much larger areas. But, you know, if we, if we look at where, where things are doing, where we're getting the most bang for the buck right now is w- with tractors that you could send out in the field and let the tractor do what, what tractors do, pulling a combine or plowing a, pulling a plow, um, you know, seating, all of those things, which can easily be done today within a very defined area uh, with fewer and fewer people who are living in farm farm areas and, and more and more equipment being used to do to automate the entire process, then the last, let's say that the next stage is to not have somebody driving the plow, but letting the plow do what it does, you know, can do on its own very well. Uh, to, to me, the, the, the key leveraging point, I mean, this is 
leveraging human capability. I mean, this is this is where the steam engine, the the water wheel, the all those other things that that sort of came in to help us lift stuff and and because we couldn't lift it or we couldn't carry it or whatever. Uh, the energy aspect of that has been leveraged. To me, the, the automation piece uh, that is that is happening now, we, we've had things like conveyor belts for a long time transporting mm-hmm. things where we haven't transported. The problem is that they were fixed. They weren't flexible. The opportunity now with the, the vehicles and the things that you mentioned is that you can plow not just one field, you can plow two fields, you can plow three fields. You can plow one field one way and you can plow it the other way. It, it has it has the opportunity to be flexible. You can, you can put this in a mine when the mine is so big, but if the mine changes in size, especially with some of these mines, then this thing then becomes flexible and 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 has that opportunity so the big leveraging point at least to me with the with the current state of automation in terms of leveraging the kinds of things an individual can do it now is is not only being able to do what the individual did but do it in in it in in at least a slightly if not even more than slightly different um uh vestige and so, uh, you know, that is the, the real flexibility, uh, the opportunities, you know, that you, you walk into an Amazon uh, uh, warehouse these days, not only are there the, the conveyors and the typical sort of um, 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 pick and, 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 and pluck type of things, but there's also these variable things that move around there, almost mm-hmm. like a human. The reason you had a human is the reason these places still employ maybe a thousand people or two thousand people is because you need you need the brains and the variability that the human provides. Now if you can put that in the thing so that then it begins to have the same flexibility and variability that we have, as well as do more and do it continuously and do it 24-7 and da 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 my goodness, that, that's where the leveraging point comes in. Yeah, exactly. So there's a purpose, there's a, there's a business case, there's a purpose, there's a technology which is capable of doing things within the the defined area within the defined task and that to to a large degree we can use the the tools that are available to us with our artificial intelligence or less than artificial intelligence to get these tasks done you know the the as i we've we've agreed and have said many times driving a car is harder than rocket science Driving a car is very, yes. very difficult, which is why we, 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 yeah, we've been trying real hard for the last 20 years, but we haven't come very far. If you have the, the application that the military has, where they have vehicles that are being driven by robots inside that vehicle, the, 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 the mission is simple. The road is, is defined. Uh, if the car goes off or the, or the vehicle goes off the road and blows up, you've accomplished one objective, which is the person isn't killed who's driving it. That's, that's the primary objective of, not, of having a driverless vehicle, to not have somebody in it when it blows up. Now, that's not the purpose, and that's not the primary mission of driving your kid to school or driving yourself to work. <laughs> You know, that's, that's, that's totally different. So the military has been doing this, you know, with, with Oshkosh, my gosh, uh, for the last 20, <laughs> almost 20 years, 15 years. Almost and they're doing 20 it very years. Well. I mean, yeah. And, and uh, you know, if I've given, I've, I've tried to give as many examples as I could of It's only limited. I mean, there's so many, so many companies that are doing, doing this. Um, I haven't. I think if, if you could look at what I've said about Waymo, Waymo is focusing on trucks. And what I've said about trucks is that's the least, I think that's that's the one area where I wouldn't focus at this point in time. There's so many other places where work can be done, where vehicles could be could be developed to drive themselves. Putting trucks on, a, on highways 
is probably not as difficult, although we haven't proven that yet, as, as getting passenger cars uh, to be driverless. But it's not the area, and that's what I've done with these with the charts. It's not the area where you get the biggest return for the amount of money you're putting in. That's what you're trying to do here. I mean, that's the whole point of being able to, you know, it's not saving lives uh, when, when it comes to, to plowing a field. It's being able to do something less expensive and having the, the possibility of doing other things. And I've given the example of, you know, driving your car listening to a symphony orchestra in 1850 you couldn't drive in a in a, in a carriage and, and listen to the to the orchestra or an opera in at, at the la scala in, in milano you know that wasn't possible it's possible today you know that those are the kinds of things we've 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 we've, we've been very inventive as i said our biggest invention was the inventor we create you know to to be an inventor and to be able to do all of these things it's just, this is what we're all about this is why we're here and it's all about r return on investment and i think in in the in the application <laughs> that you, you you talk about it's all about that because what you have an entity who's trying to produce a product at the, uh, to make as much money as possible. How do you make as much money as possible? You charge a, a whole heck of a lot, or you make it really cheaply and charge less. And and so the objective is that my goodness, why just spend a bunch of money to create something? Uh, let's spend less, and therefore make it available at a cheaper cost, and therefore you know put this out on the market on the on the demand curve and yeah. you put it on the demand curve then you scale and all the all the good things all the you know less than econ 101 it's econ point 101 or point oh 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 101 i mean it's it's basic uh, you know a, a lemonade stand out in front I mean, and what you do, and, and it's return on investment. I agree with you with respect to trying to automate trucks. I mean, I, I, it is amazing that those folks are out there trying to take a driver out of an AT, uh, out of a Class A truck. Mm -hmm. The stuff that moves in Class A trucks is really valuable. That's why it's moving on the Class A truck. Yeah. Otherwise, it'd be moving on a choo-choo. Okay? And because it's that... <laughs> My goodness, you probably can afford a, a, a concierge, a driver, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. somebody. Yes. Okay? And if you remove that person, you're not getting the benefit of everything else that that individual does in case something happens, in case whatever, in case whatever, in case whatever. And so if you really look at the return on investment of removing the driver, I claim there isn't much. If I'm yeah. the CEO of, of of U.S. Express or you know or, or uh, you know a, a big trucking company Schneider or whatever, get out of here. And which what I where I think that all that investment should go so it should go on helping the driver, helping well, he, he or her have a better life there. Yeah, that's, my goodness, that's, you know that's these the are my employees. Are this is my family. This is you know. Boy, I'm, I think I'll show on for that. But to yeah. show on, to take them out of there when, when that person is fundamentally valuable to me, moving, you know, a lot of very valuable stuff. It's crazy. Yeah. But, I, you know, that's that's the way I come at it. It seems like, oh, Waymo's doing trucks. Although I think there was a little article this week that sort of suggested maybe Waymo's going to back out of the truck. I don't know. No, no, maybe, maybe, maybe I, Waymo's I didn't read that closely. Maybe Waymo's <laughs> Michael, back Michael out you did thing. bring up. Yeah, you did <laughs> yeah. bring up some of the uh, companies uh, specifically in, yeah. in the dispatcher, and I know Alan, you saw some of these companies at CES. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I've, I've 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 mentioned some that that are that have been getting a lot of investment, and others that that maybe people haven't really heard about. I mean, there's, there was a big thing about Einride. Uh, I think it was mainly misunderstanding, you know, what it what it was that that this Swedish little Swedish company uh, had gotten the ability to drive around on, on public roads, and I wanted to take a little bit of time to to uh, to do that um but you know who's who's 
have we have we had Komatsu at the uh, at CES? I mean, were were they were they there showing off their their dump truck that goes down into the mines? Um, I, don't, I don't think Caterpillar so. was there. Caterpillar was yeah, there. Caterpillar, Caterpillar was there. Yeah, and, Caterpillar. And whatever. A, and then, yeah, I mean, I think uh, John Deere is the is the example that I that I John Deere was there. Yeah, and John Deere has gotten uh, gotten some awards. Uh, from CES, and I think uh, I think they've done a good job of positioning themselves. But at, you know, that's they're not making any any headlines or any money by being there. And one of the classifications that I that I try to use here is that there's there's three groups. One is that's developing multi-purpose driverless applications. The others that are developing specifically work-related, drive, driverless work vehicle related for licensing. And then the third group, which is where I would be putting my money, are the companies like Komatsu, like like uh, John Deere and, and Caterpillar, um, who are developing these, uh, these systems where there's a clear model to show that the gross profit over a period of time, let's say four years of of, um, of ownership, where there's a there's a clear amount of money that you gain by reducing the equivalent labor costs of having having uh, the system driving itself as opposed to being driven by by someone. And uh, and there are lots of things that are involved in this. I mean, there's there's seasonal work. You know, how do, how do you pay for something that's only being used for a particular period of time? And I give the example of the of the Zamboni. Uh, this is this is fascinating. I mean, I've always been fascinated by Zambonis, same way as I've been fascinated by <laughs> steam trains. And I want to. I want the first time I saw one of those, I said, I want to go out there. And I want to drive that thing around. Uh, as far as I know, there isn't there isn't an automated. You know, driverless Zamboni, but who knows? You know, maybe there's they're thinking it one up in the back room somewhere. I, I would think the ODD would be pretty easy. On <laughs> pretty, yeah, pretty straightforward. And you know, this, the, the likelihood of, of you know running off and hitting somebody is pretty small unless you've got somebody you know, playing around, you know, practicing at the other it, end of the rink. But but it is tougher to apply on a Zamboni because there are rink rats at every rink. And yeah. a rink rack rat can drive a Zamboni and have a lot of fun, and they just want to do it. If you're one of these mines out in the middle of nowhere in which yeah. you have to drive one of these things to go put it out there, whatever, to process it, I mean, you yeah. have to take an end. There aren't mine, <laughs> mine rats yeah. You know, out there just willing to do it okay yeah. for the fun of it it is work yep. and it is not pretty work i i, I believe I, I, that, and and in talking to the people at, at caterpillar you know they they sort of explain explained that, that mm-hmm. at least that's what the, the guy that i was talking to at ces and he, mm-hmm. he sort of agreed with me that look you know it, it, it's it's not a good place to work, okay? So yes, you need some, but boy, if you can, you know, uh, take the burden off the individual and and you know let I know I know you're taking away a job, but there are some jobs that should be taken away. You know, toll takers on the New Jersey Turnpike, for example. You know. I guess, but anyway, um, I don't want to open that can of worms because I'll no. get myself into trouble. But, but, but that, let's look but at there, it this that, way. It is, it, I, yeah, I, I agree with you. I don't, you know, and I, but I, I don't. Yeah, I don't take the, the 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 approach that the economists take, which is that you know, a job lost is a job gained, or maybe a job lost is many jobs gained. I don't, I don't really believe that. But if you look at the empirical evidence over the course of history population of, of, of humans has gone from zero to 7.9 billion you know and, and it's, it's not like we we're doing a lot less work today than we did to keep ourselves alive 200,000 years ago or even six six thousand years ago so something's working you know it's we're, we're doing a lot of things but the population keeps 
keeps going up. Something's working here. You know, we're not dying off because we can't feed ourselves or that, you know, uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll pick this up in the next, in the March issue of the, of, of the maybe, dispatch. Maybe it's a big Ponzi scheme. I, it's a big I hope Ponzi it's scheme. not a big Ponzi. <laughs> yeah. but, but it is, you know, it almost looks like a big Ponzi scheme. One wonders, you know, and in some sense, um, I guess, uh, I guess uh, we're doing less but consuming more, and therefore we need more of these things. Putting in a, I, yes, we don't want to go there. It's no. it, it's a tough one. Yeah. Well, this is a really uh, in depth uh, piece, as as most of the dispatcher is almost every edition. So we really encourage people to to read this right. to, to to get the the full value of this. This is just a taste. You have another uh, headline we want to turn to as well, Michael Stellantis, reaching for the data star. Yeah, I I, uh, I, I think the the um, CEO of of um, Stellantis, Carlos Tavares, he's he's one of the clearest clearest thinkers on the on the stage right now, the the, the automotive stage. Um, but when it comes to this business about you know, data, free to move, and all, all this other stuff, I've, I think he, like many of the other other companies, Volvo comes to mind here, um, Volvo Cars, they're they're trying to do something that has more to do with the value of their company and more to do with the value of their stock than with what it actually ends up being for the consumers or for the company itself. Yeah, they've set up this this organization, and they're going to, to you know get 20 billion in uh, in revenue uh, over the course of the next 10 years and build this thing up. But it's uh, there's too much of that. I think on the one hand, he's been very clear. You know, we, we think that, that electric cars are not not the answer. We think that that we should be doing much more. But at the same time, we can't ignore it because the, the you know the markets and the governments are forcing us into this. So we're gonna we're gonna do as much as we can, but we're gonna continue to do as 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 much as we can in order to stay in business as a company, as opposed to just disappearing because uh, the Chinese are coming in. And he's also been very very clear on on talking about the relationship between elect electrification and the the invasion of the Western Western countries with electric cars, and I've written about that. So, I, I just wanted to put this in here to to identify something that's that's being done that others are talking about. That now Stellantis is is focusing on this as well, and and also, you know, where did he talk about this? It's at CES. You know, what these are the kinds of things they're not they're not interested in in hearing about uh, you know why ICE vehicles will continue in the in the future. They're interested in hearing things that are going to be you know. Something that can be could be discussed at at CES, uh, Consumer Electronics Show. So that's that was the point of this that little feature. Ter terrific. This headline should be of interest to many. Uh, winters can be cold. Battery electric vehicles like it hot. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> you just mentioned ice vehicles, which is yeah. internal combustion. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we have. I give the example here. We we bought a a um, a new Rav4 hybrid, uh, ice ice and battery, no cables. Um, and we saw that that when from the time we picked it up in August, late August, September, actually, we were getting, you know, X. Uh, but by the time that the uh, minus five ten Celsius rolled in. We we saw that we weren't doing anything different. We weren't driving in any different roads, but we saw that the the uh, miles per gallon or or um, or liters per kilometer um, was reduced by about twenty percent. And this is something that's that's proven, that's shown. But unfortunately, the the car companies aren't discussing it. So if you buy one of these things. In Sweden, uh, where it's cold, or in Norway, or in in Montana, or Detroit, uh, Michigan, um, you can expect to get the same the same range as you would get uh, driving that same car around in in Texas or in in Florida. Um, and the, it's really 
I think it's incumbent upon the companies to to make this make this known, and they're not. They're not. They're not saying it. They're not doing enough to show that this is actually the case. I think they're going to be made to do that. I'm sure they will be made to do that. Yeah, that would make that would certainly make a lot of sense because if people have an expectation when they're when they put in a destination that they're, they're going to have to charge up once or, or whatever, and that's not the case, then yeah. they need to know that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Especially since the, the infrastructure for charging is not that extensive and you know, if you get to a place where there's there are a couple of chargers and they're being used you have no idea you know you have to go up to them and say are you are you will, will you be here for 20 minutes or will you be here for two hours what do what you what's what's your expectation so that I can either go to another place or settle in at the hotel and you know try to get here in the middle of the night when nobody's when nobody else is charging. I mean, I, I just wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to be in that right. position. I, that, that's like the last thing I would want to be thinking about. Uh, the same is true for all batteries. We should point out because I love digital photography. If I take a a, a hike in in really cold weather, unless I keep the camera and the battery under my coat, that battery's going to die out much faster than it would in the spring or summer. It's yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh boy, we have become so needy and so demanding. I mean, what, I, what if what uh, what what did the poor people who lived you know uh, five thousand years ago have to go through? But anyway, it's great to be alive today instead of then. Go ahead. I mean, Al, Al, Alan is saying the horses didn't travel as well in cold weather. <laughs> I, I I don't know. I mean, I, I just maybe can't. they did. Maybe they did. I have no idea. But but. You know, with this this gets back to what we were talking about earlier. We have set up a lifestyle that re requires a heck of a lot more care and feeding, and we each consume a lot more, and and we we need a we need help in producing the stuff that we consume. Uh, somebody could say maybe you know that's ruining the planet or that's causing who knows what to do da da da. da. I don't know, but uh, I, we don't want to get into the, to that whole discussion. But it certainly um, it it takes much more to keep us to, to keep us, I guess, happy each day. Or many of us are almost independent of where we are on the on the, the, the distribution of, of resources. And, um, but um, anyway, it's just interesting to sit here and listen to, to some of this stuff. Um, we've talked about the electric vehicles. Again, uh, I, I think we've made up our minds and maybe, or maybe I've made up my mind and I'm stop, I've stopped listening. Uh, but uh, I sort of agree. I just don't see how we scale this. I just don't see how we scale this, and especially you know after my my trip to uh, to Africa and and to and to Kenya and so on. I just don't see how we scale this. I mean, there there's there's energy needs in 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 Kenya to do a lot more things than than propel the vehicle. You know, we're sitting there at, at, at a university going to having a demonstration of this, you know, innovative chip making thing and whatever and so on and so forth that they're trying to do. And, and the lights blinked. Okay. You know, every time the lights blink, I don't know. You better have a battery backup. Otherwise, you got to reboot. Okay. And, and maybe you should have the battery back up. And I mean, we so much of our lives has uses electricity for things that are really necessary for which we don't have a very good alternative. You know, to, to do lighting and 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 power the motors and so on in our homes and so on to, to go to some other energy source to do that rather than electricity we're kind of stuck in that corner we need it for that and we have a reasonably efficient energy source to move us from a to b and all of a sudden say now we have to transform that to now use electricity when 
we don't really, I don't believe we have excess electricity hanging around. We don't. We seem to have excess oil hanging around. We have excess coal hanging around. We have excess, you know, we have that in the excess. And it's pretty inexpensive. And if we, you know, really focused on making that a, a f- efficient and taking the dirtiness out of that, we might be a whole heck of a lot better off. And then if you look at, at, at the energy losses and the creation of electricity, the, the way we currently create electricity, oh my goodness, that is very inefficient. <clears throat> now, yes, if we could change that and have it all come for free out of the sun and the sky, I guess. <sighs> but we're not there. So I don't know. Whatever. It's... it's um, you know, well, going back there, to what there I are said, certainly a lot of issues too, and and the, the bi-directional charging is being uh, promoted by some as being at least helpful. Bi-directional charging, really? I'm going to get losses this way, and then losses that way, and then losses this way, and then losses that way. What do I end up with a net? Yeah, yeah that a- assumes there's no loss. That's, that assumes that the energy that I have here, I can put it in the battery of my car, and then my car can do that and whatever, and all that stuff happens without loss. Look at the process. But we, I don't the, know. I guess the, I'm goofy. This discussion has been has been hijacked by politicians and by kids. I'm sorry. I mean, it's like. You know, if I've got somebody who started when she was 15 years old and she's now 20 years old and she's still showing up at Davos saying exactly the same thing she said the first time she was there, which was nothing. You know, you don't, you aren't doing enough. You know, the climate. We're, I don't have a life. I'm not going to be able to live. You know, in, in 10 years because the planet is going to, to disappear. And and if if that's the message that you're taking and the politicians are are believing and all of the policies that the EU in particular and other countries like the United States are are implementing then we we don't have this the the, the the this is going in the wrong direction too quickly and in the end someone is going to wake up and say no this we made a big mistake there have been there have been mistakes made it's like we have to we have to get this ship turned around. I think, um, you know, there have to be more people in, who are CEOs of companies than Car- Carlos Tavares, who are telling people that this is the way things should be and and stop doing these things because we're just going to, you know, we're working ourselves into a, a corner that we're not going to be able to get out of. And you know, not to jump to, to the things I was listening to the. Uh... Uh, to the Tesla, you know, fourth quarter report, and then Elon's announcement of of the expansion of the battery plant in Nevada, and and looking at, I mean, even with that massive expansion of the battery plant, you know, that's gonna pre- that, that's 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 almost nothing yeah. compared to what it is needed if you're really going to do the conversion of 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 a substantial part of the fleet of mobility to uh, to battery electrics. Yeah. And where is the stuff going to come from and where is it going to be produced and and what are what are the implications of all of that? I mean, sure, if if it's nothing then I, you know, I'm sorry I brought it up. But, <sighs> cut but it, it is, out. It isn't nothing. I mean, and, and there, I, there are I people agree. who are saying At least, this. But if you if you've got someone like Al Gore, and I saw him on the on stage at uh, at a, a little clip of, of uh, Davos, my favorite place, um, you know, and and he's it is he's, he's, ran, he's ranting. I mean, he's he's like say, if you don't do this, we're we're just we're all going to be toast. And you've got someone who was the vice you know vice president. Of, of the, of the United States during a during a, a period of time when the when everything looked like it was going in the right direction, um, 
you know, the, the someone who helped the dot com age standing up, <laughs> oh, sitting he created there. It. He created yeah. it. He, he created, created, created it. it. Yeah, he's the father of the internet. <laughs> now, yeah. now, now, boys. Okay. Um, <laughs> saying, you know, saying this, and people are listening to it, and and they're 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 believing it. Now, he's not he's not a, a stupid person, and he's not an evil person. Uh, whether he believes a hundred percent of what he's saying, or he's he's saying it a little bit with with some th- theatrical uh, effects in order to get his point across, but it's it's having an effect certainly on the kids who are saying you know gluing themselves to streets and and to pieces of you know priceless artwork, saying you have to do something now or else you know we're we're going to be we're going to be gone. We have a real problem, and it's a problem a big problem of communication and understanding. You know, it's the same problem with climate as we have with, with politics. People are not listening to each other. They've got their positions set and they're not they're not able to listen to something that, that doesn't necess- doesn't completely agree with their approach to life. Or death. <laughs> Well, Alan, you mentioned uh, the Tesla earnings call, and you do highlight that in, in the newsletter. And I think, among other things, uh, Musk said that they may be building three million vehicles this year. No, 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 no. I think the number is two. He said his capacity, and they'll, they're looking to build one point eight or something, whatever. And and I think I think he was he was. Um, he, he he was mute. He was muted him, he, a lot. I think, um, which which is good because you know, of course, he's he is the promoter. He's been out there promoting, and uh, he's gotten, I guess, a little is hands and <laughs> slap with a ruler. Where's my ruler? Or whatever. And maybe he's backing off a little bit. It, it was it was it was fairly muted, but it. It is somewhat impressive. I mean, the, the fact that, that a car company in a U.S. car company has come out of nowhere in a 15-year per- year period. And uh, globally, I guess everybody agrees they'll probably be able to make 1.8 million cars. Um, you know, that's that's non-trivial accomplishment, okay? Uh, 1.8 million when there are how many sold every year? 30 million? What's the number worldwide? 79 million. 79 million worldwide. Is it and, seven, and it was, is it was it higher. Million. It yeah, was 79. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so whatever the number is, I mean, you know, it's, but it's, you pay attention. Whether or not that then implies that, that, Everything's going to be Teslas, and you know, five years from now, and everybody's going to have to buy one of these things. Uh, you look at, at, at what it takes, what it takes for it. You know, the the battery business is is non-trivial. Uh, is non-trivial, and they're heavy. And and the other car companies, what what size vehicles are they building, and how heavy are these things? And who would have thought when we when we went into electric vehicles that all of a sudden it'd be the reason to put tanks back out on the road, Hummer tanks? I mean, who 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 thought of that one? I mean, it's just what? It's like crazy stuff. I don't know. Layoffs, Alan. Uh, they've uh, been hitting the tech industry pretty hard, and now Waymo is uh, laying people off. Who would have thought, you know, 12 months ago? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Who would have thought? Who would have thought these companies were, like, hiring people? Like, uh, there was no tomorrow. Universities were producing computer scientists and AI for people, whatever. And who, who, of course, this was the industry to be in. And now there are layoffs. It's like playoffs, layoffs. I mean, it's like crazy, whatever. But I can, you can imagine that doing all that hiring, and I guess maybe some people down at the tail end of a distribution got hired. And I think it's a good time to weed them out. 
the, good luck to a, those folks getting another job. I mean, they must. I mean, can, do, you, do you know how how far on the tail of a distribution of quality you have to be before, you know, Waymo would lay you off? I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm I'm, I'm not <laughs> seeing it correctly, but. Michael, <laughs> no, uh, there was a, there was an article in our one of our our newspapers here. It was kind of tongue in cheek, but but um, the um, we have a company here that was was started here called Spotify. You probably heard of it. It's you know, yeah, yeah, sure. streaming, of music course. streaming, and uh, the, people can listen to this uh, podcast on Spotify. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, and, yeah, and the the the, the Swedish founder and, and CEO of Spotify. Uh, came out and said, I'm, I'm, "I'm taking full responsibility for for this. You know, we're, our our sales are down. We're you know, not, and and so I'm going to lay off 8,000 people or whatever the number was." And the, yeah. the journalist thought, "Well, why don't you start with yourself? If you're taking full responsibility, you know, why don't you lay yourself off?" And I know this is this is the same thing that every single one of the CEOs say. I'm taking this is you know, I'm going to take full responsibility. I'm laying off fifteen thousand people. You you're gone tomorrow. That's the end of you. I'm still going to get my bonus, and I'm still going to fly my own, you know, my private jet and so on. It was it was a really good article. I mean. You have to take it with a grain of Swedish salt that it would be written in a in a you know Swedish newspaper something like that. But um, I guess you got you're getting me to comment. Um, um, I agree. I think some I think I think some of these companies have made the wrong call. They've gone after the wrong market. They didn't look at return on investment. They, they, and, and in fact, uh, the reason why, I mean, pre pandemic, I used to, I had this chart that I sort of made plotting, you know, the number of, of vehicles in, in the Waymo fleet from two to 20 to 200 to 2000 to 20,000 and so on. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess I should put it this way on a semi log chart. And the thing was like this with even an upturn in terms of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that meant that at least in the beginning, looking back, with it, the way they were going was, you know, it was already exponential. It was already a hockey stick, a hell of a hockey stick. If you put it in linear, linear, as opposed to... And what's happened? It's, 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 it, it completely collapsed the market for this, mm -hmm. the expectations, the progress. And it's probably not due to the marginal employees, probably due to the leadership who took this thing to this point and boy in the last year it's been free fall Argo AI free fall I mean you look at the other ones and so on oh my goodness <sighs> poor Aurora <sighs> it's too simple you know, I mean, and, and, and all of them, and, 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 you know, GM Cruise made some progress and so on, but boy, this has to be, in the end, this has to be a business. There is no government bailout on this thing. Don't expect the transit industry to all of a sudden throw money. It doesn't have enough. That's right. You know, the, the play here was to really do mobility on a scale basis. Not on a onesie twosie, and my goodness, uh, maybe we should just start over. I don't know. But I don't. But, I don't think we need to start over. I think that we we can ignore. If Waymo goes away, 
you know, if, if Google says, look, we, we've got to save money, this is one area where we're spending too much money and there is no return, we can see that. And all the people who are there need to go someplace. They can go to Oshkosh. They can go to John Deere and Caterpillar and, and uh, Kumatsu and Volt. They can go to places where their, their, their work can be appreciated and be applied quite readily and easily. But I not think. in the volumes that were at Waymo, not in the volumes that were at Argo, not at the volumes that are in these places. These places, sure, you know, Waymo started out 50 people. It oh, was you mean, like, you know, you mean there are too many amazing. people? You mean there are too many people there to 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 hire? I have no, I have no, I I, I don't know what the what the what the head count is. Yeah. And then you have to look at not only the head count, you have you have to look at, at at who the the contractors are. Can you imagine what happened to the contractors at Waymo? You know the contractors that run the you know the car maintenance facilities and who knows what. I guess you know those folks must have stopped getting checks. Who knows when? Sure. Yeah. Because 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 they weren't all Waymo. They weren't all. They aren't those. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Okay. I haven't. Se- I haven't seen the reportings. I haven't really searched for them. But I can just imagine because they're going to go first, and now they're they're into their own. <sighs> yes. Yeah. They, always, they yeah. start. They start with the, the contract. There's a real. Then. There's a reality here that my goodness, what are we doing this? Well, I mean, these are private companies. And it's a good thing they're not looking for a government handout, you know, alms for the poor. Because <laughs> I hope there's no alms for these poor. <laughs> those, those folks working at Waymo are making a lot of money. They're I, I, make, I, they're I making they, a lot of money. They are I, making a lot of money. I, I, I guess they are. I, I haven't yeah. seen. I, I haven't seen it, but I, I am looked for it. I guess they are. They're making a hell, heck of a lot more than me. Here I am. I don't have two nickels to rub together here. We're not feeling uh, sorry for you, Alan. Here. <laughs> oh, jeez! <laughs> did, did, didn't you just say you went to Kenya? I mean, that was that a free? Was that a freebie? No, but you know, whatever. It's okay. Look at you know. <laughs> at our you. age, we we can afford a little fishing trip here and a little <sighs> safari there. It's oh, a good thing man, that Fred stays home and takes care of the the nitty. Thank you, Fred, for <laughs> staying home. I mean, really, um, Elizabeth and I had a trip of a lifetime. Well, we have another headline or two to to get to yep. before we wrap up here. Uh, Consumer Reports, Alan says Ford's Blue Cruise is now ahead of GM's Super Cruise as its top-rated active driving assistance system. And Tesla drops the seventh. I, I don't know. I, I haven't gone out and tested them. I look I, you, you, Okay. To rate things, you need, you, you, you need a number, uh, you know, a single number that you then can say, hey, two is less than three and four or whatever, you know, the rank order. I mean, that's how we rank order. We take everything and we take it down to a single number and then compare the number. Okay. The issue is, is if you look at one of these things, how do consumer reports take the various capabilities of these things, (laughs) assemble them in their, you know, high dimensional representation of, of, taking apples, oranges, and bananas and adding them all up to then get a number to then rank them, okay? So, you know, and whatever that is, um, yeah, I guess Ford came out on top. You have to look at each of the components and how they rated each of the components and say, if you're looking for one of these things, which components are important to you, okay? If, if you tend to misbehave in using these things and you need to have, you know, your hand slapped when you misbehave, then maybe some of these things are better because they have hand slappers on them. Who pay attention? Okay. Others don't. 
is that good or bad? Whatever, what do you need? Uh, am I going to be somewhat lulled into thinking, hey, these things really can drive me and therefore I can hop in the back seat and have a good time? Uh, okay, then, you know, I better have something that throws me back into the driver's seat. I don't know. But there, there are various measures that are accounted for in there. It is very good that Consumer Reports has done that. One measure that isn't there is how well are these systems integrated with the automatic emergency braking system of the car? Okay. To me, that is really important. And as far as I know, none of them are, which is bad. So you have one system sort of, people talk about hands off. I talk about feet off. To me, the, the most valuable piece of these systems is I don't have to sit there with my feet trying to play around with the darn thing. You know, to me, having my hands on a wheel is no big thing. I, I sort of, you know, turn to whatever. I actually go down the road going, doing this. I'm, you know, and that's fine. But going fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow on the feet drives me nuts in terms of the way I look at it. So I look at the capabilities of this alleviating what I have to do with my feet, okay, because I don't do that well, all right? The other piece of this thing is is that there's, you know, that's for normal operation of these things, cruising down the New Jersey Turnpike or the Pennsylvania Turnpike or whatever, okay? The emerge, automated emergency braking thing is, oh my goodness, something is happening ahead that I'm not figuring out and the car needs to take over and bail me out. Okay, that's the really important one. To me, save my life, save me from cracking up, save, do, do that for me. That's what these systems should be, you know, focused on, and that's they don't have it in there. And it, cars have it, and cars have this other one, but they're not working. I don't believe they're working together. It's one system over here, one system over there. We have to move away from that. Well, we hope to have a conversation with uh, Consumer yeah. Reports in the in the near future about this about that. as yeah. well. Right. Well, on that note, uh, we want to thank you, Michael, for spending time with us once again. Uh, terrific edition, uh, a great read of The Dispatcher. The website is michaellsena.com. Great seeing you again, Michael. Thank you. Great to be here with you. Thank you for being with us, Michael. Great having my, you. You know, my, each month. I mean, we, 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 you know, we, we have a good time with this, and yeah. I guess... It's one of the reasons I keep writing. This is one of the reasons we keep doing podcasts. <laughs> no, it, it is a it is a lot of fun. This isn't easy, okay? This is not easy, and it's it's you know we sort of have some opinions. Um, um, it's um, it's 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 a challenge. Thank you to CARTS, the Corporation for Automated Road Transportation Safety, for helping to make this podcast possible. CARTS is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to safe and high-quality mobility for all. You can find us at smartdrivingcar.com, also on Anchor FM, Spotify, TuneIn, Apple, Google, Spreaker, wherever you get your podcasts from. You can get smart speakers to play us, too. You can find my tech reports at textination.com. I'm Fred Fishkin, along with Alan Kornhauser. Thank you for listening or watching. Stay safe. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye, all.